All right, all right. Good morning. Well, that's quite an exodus of young people, isn't it? Good to see, but kind of sad. I'd like to have them in here to beat up on, I mean, to encourage them a little bit. So, hey, thanks for being here today. If you're a guest, uh, thanks for being here. here. I'm Pastor Dave, and I've been gone for the last two weeks. I had a little uh, Army training, put the Army uniform on. First Sunday I was gone, Gus Andrews preached here, and I appreciate Gus. Gus grew up in the church, went off and served in a church in Ohio for uh, 30, 30 some years, came back, settled in the area, and very available to us. And uh, that Sunday I attended a Southeast Christian Church campus at Elizabethtown, Kentucky, E-Town. Great little uh, campus there. It's not little, it's a, it's a good size. And then the second Sunday, Philip preached, did a great job. Philip, our student minister, who's upstairs now. And I attended a church on post there at Fort Knox uh, with the chaplain doing a uh, service there. And it was, a, it was a good service. So I've been to Fort Knox. Anybody been to Fort Knox? Anybody? Yeah? Yeah. Like you, I found no gold at Fort Knox. <clears throat> I found nothing really of great value to me at Fort Knox. So it's good to get that over with and, uh, and, and get back. Uh, maybe another year or so I can hang up that uniform and, uh, and be done with it once and for all. I can serve three more years, but I'm thinking about hanging it up in another year. Anyway, uh, glad you're here today. I'm glad to be back in the saddle and we're starting our series today. Starting our new series, this is going to be a series that guides us not just through the month of February, but beyond, uh, maybe for uh, not just this year, but maybe for years to come, because it's such a great theme. Now, you might remember several years ago, back in, uh, in maybe the early 2000s, a guy by the name of Bruce Wilkinson honed in on a verse of Scripture, 1 Chronicles 4.10, called the Prayer of Jabez. How many of you remember that? Prayer of Jabez is an obscure verse there uh, nestled into the middle of verses about other things, you know, kind of genealogical things. And when it gets to verse 10, it got to this man named Jabez, and he asked God for three things. He asked God to bless him. He asked God to enlarge his territory. And he asked God to keep him free from pain. Very popular book, very popular prayer. And this, uh, this book kind of went viral, Bruce Wilkinson's book. Made him famous. It went viral. A lot of churches picked up on it. A lot of preachers preached on it. And it's a popular prayer. I mean, who wouldn't want to be blessed by God? Who wouldn't want their territory enlarged, whatever that means? Maybe more property around. And who wouldn't want a life free from pain? It was a, it was a popular a theme for a little while. And uh, to be honest with you, it never felt right to me. Never felt right. It always seemed like it was a little bit self-centered, this prayer of Jabez. Now, God granted his request, so that means that God honored that request. And we don't know the back story on Jabez. We don't know the front story on Jabez. We just have this one verse about him. So, you know, God honored that, and that's God's prerogative to honor any prayer he wants to honor, anything he wants to honor. He's not bound or obligated to honor uh, anything, but he, he did that because he's a God of free will, free choice, and he honored that prayer. But it never felt right to me that I should ask for God to bless me and enlarge my territory and keep me free from pain. Because as you know, and will I'm sure agree, some of my greatest growth, some of your greatest spiritual growth, growth in your life, growth in your marriage, comes through adversity, comes through pain, right? That's when, that's when we really grow, learn to depend on God. So we don't know the backstory on Jabez, uh, but a few years ago, our staff, most of our staff went to what used to be the North American Christian Convention, our tribe of churches' main convention where we go worship together and hear great speakers and fellowship with each other all over the country and even other people in the other parts of the world. Now it's called the Spire Conference, and we went and we met a preacher there uh, from the Manchester Christian Church in um, uh, New England, one of the New England states. <clears throat> His name was Bo Chansey. 
And Bo had written a book uh, in 2015 called Pray for One. And some of our folks met Bo and mingled with Bo, and Bo at that time was, well, he was pushing his book and he was pushing his, his theme. And it, it really is a great theme. It's a great prayer. It's, his prayer is a unifying prayer. It's a, it's a prayer of deployment and mobilization. It's not a circle the wagons prayer. You know, the last couple years, the church in America and all over the world has kind of been circling the wagons. We've been wondering who's coming back, who's back, who's coming back, who's not coming back. Are we going to survive? Is the church going to make it? Are we going to have to bow to the government every time they say close the doors? And, and uh, are we going to have to, to give in to a virus or a pandemic? Pandemic of any kind, uh, you, you know, and if you, if you study church history, you never find a place where the church stopped being the church because of a virus or any kind of pandemic. In fact, that's when the church kicked it into high gear. And I'm telling you, we've been sitting on this theme, Chancey's theme, but really it's a biblical theme, pray for one, for a few years now, looking for the right time to execute it. And I want to tell you, now is the time. Now is the time to execute Pray for One because the church, you know, we want the Lord to build the church. The church is a hospital for hurting people, isn't it? it the, the church is a lighthouse in the darkness. It's a refuge in the storm. It, it's not, uh, the church is not a, a cower in fear organization or body. It is a courageous army of God's people. That's what the church is, capital C. And God has fully equipped the church to do what God has put before the church to do. He's fully equipped us to do these things. And so that's what we got to do. Uh, the fields are ripe. Jesus said the fields are ripe in his day. No doubt the fields are ripe today. We live in communities where there are homeless people and addicted people and people addicted to drugs and alcohol and sex and addicted to money, addicted to their lust, their pride, their greed, and uh, chasing this and chasing that just to make themselves happy. They're trying to fill that void in their heart and they're running on empty and they're ruining their lives and their marriages and their reputations. They're trying to incorporate their own ideas and what they want into to these parts of their life and it's just not working. And I want to tell you folks, it's time for the church to be the church. And that's what we got to do. Jesus wants to set us free from all that and he can. He wants to work through the people known as his people, the church. Now for far too long, we have depended on the government to do for us and do for our communities what the church ought to be doing. Now, I'm not saying there's not a role for government. There definitely is. God ordains a government in the Bible, Romans 13, Hebrews, and a few other places. But there are things that the church ought to be doing that we have given over to the government. And I want to tell you, some trust in horses and some trust in chariots, which I think is a reference to government, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. It's time for us to get out there. It's time for us to deploy, to use a military term, to mobilize, to uncircle the wagons, and to go do what God wants us to do. And it starts with prayer. It starts with prayer. This is our greatest weapon. It's our most consistent weapon. It's the weapon that everybody can use. You may not be able to play an instrument or sing and worship God in that way like will be done in heaven. You might not be able to preach or teach or uh, lead a Bible study even, though I think you probably could, but you can pray. You can pray. You know, we have a prayer ministry in the church. It's a behind-the-scenes ministry. You may not know much about it, and that's exactly where a prayer ministry needs to be, behind the scenes. But it also needs to be up front. And uh, Jane Hayner, a lady in our church, she was here last service, leads this ministry. Maybe you're a part of it. And every week, Jane sends out prayer assignments. So the people that are on her ministry team, she sends them out and says, hey, this week I want you to pray for this. I want you to pray for him. I want you to pray for her and whatever it is. And I appreciate and depend on and rely on that ministry. But what if everybody was in that ministry? I'm going to ask you this month, this year, to be in, if not on paper, at least figuratively, the prayer ministry of the Gateway Christian Church. Because you, if, if you're here and if you're a follower of Jesus, you're in the army. You're in the army. You're mobilized. 
And so today we're going to start this series, Pray for One, by learning how to pray for everyone. Matthew 5 in your Bible, if you have Matthew 5, Matthew 5 is uh, the place where Jesus' most famous sermon begins. The most famous sermon covers three chapters, Matthew 5, 6, and 7, and it's called, anybody know, the Sermon on the Mount. It's his most famous sermon. It's when Jesus really laid out his agenda. He laid out the principles by which he would be operating. He, he challenged the Jewish theology. He challenged uh, first century thinking and even our own thinking by laying this out here and saying, uh, you know, this is the way it used to be. This is the way it is now. He said, I have not come to abolish the Old Testament. I've come to fulfill it. I'm going to take it up a notch. Now, he starts out really with what we call the Beatitudes. And so, uh, these, you know, these Beatitudes start with the word blessed, blessed. Or if, uh, when I was growing up, blessed was a two-syllable word, blessed. And that's the way the old-time preachers used to say it, blessed. Along with uh, other words, they turned into multi-syllable words. But it's blessed, and it means happy. If we were giving this sermon of Jesus a title, we might title it God's Plan for a Happy Life. God's Plan for a Happy Life. You want a happy life, don't you? Everybody want a happy life? Yeah, we all want a happy Nobody wants a pain-filled life. I mean, we're all like Jabez in that way. We want a pain-free life. Fact of the matter is, you know, we're not going to have that. At some point, you're going to have some pain. But I want you to listen to what Jesus said. He he said, you want to be happy? Blessed are the poor in spirit. That doesn't sound like blessed, does it? Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the meek. I thought it was the strong that really did well in life. The fittest, you know, those who make the Olympics, those are the ones who get the most glory and gold. He says, blessed are the meek. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst. Blessed are those who are persecuted. Now, that doesn't sound pain-free. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely. That doesn't sound like an enlarged territory, does it? That sounds like an enlarged hurt zone. In fact, in this sermon, Jesus challenges the thinking at every turn, and he takes it up a notch. And if we're going to pray for one, I think, first of all, we need to get this. We need to understand Jesus' mentality here uh, and how we should pray for everyone. Now, you might remember the sermon I preached a few weeks ago back in January, and we called it, it was part of this series, but it was the, you know, I number the series, like this this is sermon number one. And there are six sermons in this series. Uh, And uh, that sermon was sermon number zero because it was a foundational sermon. It was a preview sermon. It was a sermon that got us up to the start line. You know, there's a lot to do to get get to the start line, let alone get to the finish line. And so that sermon was about the strategy God has for getting people back under his authority. And that strategy is not dropping bombs, it's what? planting seeds. We'd like to drop a bomb, drop truth bomb, gospel drop bomb on family members, uh, you know, on certain cities, on certain political parties, or, you know, whatever you want to do, and everybody wants to drop a bomb on somebody else and, and come around to my way of thinking. And maybe we need the bomb to be dropped on us. But God's not into dropping bombs. He's into planting seeds. That's the strategy. So this is sermon number one, and we need to understand the mentality Jesus had when it comes to viewing other people and how we treat people. Let's be honest, we can't view and treat people the way the world views and treats us or people. And so what he says is, here's everyone matters. You know, that's really what Jesus came to do, is to say it's not just about the certain race of people, the Jews, it's about everyone. But honestly, does everyone really matter to us? Are there certain people that you'd just soon not be around? I mean, they, you know, kind of like Jonah, uh, I know if I preach the gospel to the Ninevites, they're going to hear it and believe it and obey it, and God's going to love them. No, God already loved them. Are there certain people you just rather not really be next to or with? Maybe it's a family member that... Uh, 
he's always judging you. Or maybe it is somebody from a different political persuasion, or maybe it's somebody from a different kind of lifestyle. Maybe they're dirty or they don't think the way you think, and you just as soon stay away from them. Now, while you may be sitting there saying, oh, no, no, I love everybody, I'm, I'm telling you that's not true. I mean, even for me, I want to be have an honest moment here, and, and, and that sounds like I haven't been honest in the past, but a really, let me say, a confessional moment here. Not too long ago, maybe several weeks back in January, I had to go to the Kroger down here. And notice I said Kroger, no S on the end of it. I went to Kroger, and I had to pick something up for Jennifer. And I always have a little bit of trepidation when I'm going into the Kroger here in St. Albans. Because I always feel like I'm going to run into somebody who hasn't been to church lately. And I'm going to have to tell them, why, why haven't you been to church? You know, wh- where have you been? A, a little trepidation because I don't want to be that person. I don't want to be that pastor who's, you know, looking around for his, his church members and hounding them down the next aisle. Always a little trepidation for that, maybe for some other reasons. But so I went because, um, uh, you know, I couldn't go to the Gucci Kroger in Taze Valley. I wanted to get home sooner. So I, I went to Kroger and, uh, you know, this, with this trepidation. And I even, I even, I think I wore a mask. You know, you think if you wear a mask, nobody will recognize you. But as I was, I was walking in, somebody behind me in a vehicle blew the horn and said, Hey, pastor. I'm like, oh. I knew the voice, so I turned around, and uh, I'm thinking, oh, man, I hope they're leaving and not coming. I hope they're, they've just been here, and they're gone, and they're not coming. And he, he wanted me to come over and talk to him, but it was kind of a subtle come over and talk to us, but I didn't see that, you know. And so I turned, you know, I threw up my hand, I waved, I smiled, and uh, I went on in the store thinking, okay, well, I dodged the bullet there. But uh, do you know how in Kroger, and this bugs me, you know how they put those arrows in, which you got to walk down a certain way, you got to walk a certain direction in the aisles? They did that, and they've done it in other places. And, and so I'm like you, I walk the opposite direction just to see, uh, dare somebody to tell me I'm going the wrong way. But so I rounded uh, a, an aisle, a corner, and I ran into the person who was, had blown his horn at me. I mean, I ran into him. One of us is going the wrong direction, and you probably know which one. And so we talked for a little while. It was cordial, and uh, I I got away, and I I didn't have to say what I really wanted to say. I thought that was good. It was a win. Uh, And so I I had what I needed, and as I was leaving the store, I I thought about this series then. I just, you know, it was always on my mind what I'm preaching, and uh, I, I, I... I'm just being honest here, okay? Full confession. I prayed, Lord, don't let him be the one. Don't let him be my one. Okay, I know you're judging me now because I don't hear any, any kind of, uh, uh, I, I, can, I feel you, preacher. I feel you. But uh, I'm just being honest. And let you be honest with me. Is there anybody you hope not to run into at Kroger? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Man, you guys are a lot more, uh, yeah, the first service, they were like all liars, you know, they didn't, no, no, we we didn't. Yeah, there are people like that, aren't there? There are people you don't want to run into, people you just rather not uh, have be forced into a conversation with. Only time I'm not speaking for God entirely, but whoever that is, that could be your pray for one. That could be it. That could be it. And me and the Lord are still wrestling on this person and my prayer for one. You know, when Jesus preached the Sermon on the Mount, he was talking to people who had a bad taste in their mouth for some other people. He was talking to people who uh, probably had some issues with their neighbors. I know these people had a bad taste in their mouth for their religious leaders. You know, these guys who were lording it over them and always demanding one more thing from them and asking them to, uh, to, to pony up, you know, and to, and to show up and to do whatever they said they had to do. And I know these people Jesus was preaching to had a bad taste in their mouth for the, for the Romans. 
You see, the Romans were the oppressors. They had conquered the land. And these soldiers, they could care less about these Jewish people. I mean, they'd rather been some other place in the empire, but they got stuck. Their deployment, their mobilization was, uh, you know, an outpost called Judea, the backwaters of the Jordan. And these people that they were with, they just as soon kicked like a dog. And they did refer to the Jewish people as dogs. So there was, uh, there was equal hatred between these people. The Romans hated these Jewish people just because they felt better than everybody else. And the Jews hated them right back. And they had good reason to. And so when Jesus preached this sermon, he's going to change things. He's going to flip the script a little bit. And he says, look, you're the salt of the earth. You're the light of the world. And it's time you start acting like it. It's time you start acting like it wherever you go. Six times in this chapter, he uses a phrase that cues them in on their education, their religious education. This phrase was, you have heard that it was said. And anytime a rabbi was teaching, he would, he would use this phrase to kind of get people focused in on a particular passage of scripture, normally from the Old Testament or maybe some other Jewish writings. You have heard that it was said. And that was, oh yeah, okay, we've been taught this. We've been taught this. And six times at the beginning of this sermon, right after the blessed, right after the happy life, Jesus uses this phrase to kind of, to kind of get them focused in on where he wanted them focused. He says, you have heard that it was said, you shall not murder. He's trying to get them to think about how they feel about people they don't like, people they hate. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. He's trying to get them to think about how they viewed somebody of the opposite sex who wasn't their wife or husband. You have heard that it was said, you shall not swear falsely. This is, I think, a challenge to who, how they viewed authority. And if they felt their the need to protect themselves and to lie. And so six times he says, you have heard that it was said, but unlike the rabbis of his day who would go on and and, uh, exposit that Old Testament scripture, Jesus added another phrase. He said, but I say to you. And when he did this, he's about to blow their minds. He's taking it up a notch. Let's look at the next one. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Now, I think this particular set of passages, verses, really gets at how they felt about the Romans. Romans were their biggest enemy. I, I think that's, that's what this is getting at, the Romans. And, and, you know, they could tolerate a bad religious leader, but these Romans were, they were just too much. And so they hated them, as I said, and they were hated by them. So when Jesus said, you've heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for tooth, Everybody would say, yeah, that's exactly what we've been taught. That's exactly what we believe. Equal retribution. And that's really how you and I think as well. It's it's what comes natural to us. If you hurt me, I hurt you right back. You lie to me, I'll lie right back to you. If you cheat on me, I'll cheat on you. That's called equal retribution. You do it to me, I'll do it to you. Eye for eye, tooth for tooth. And they would have high-fived on that. They would have said, yeah, that's the way we are, and that's what we're happy with. Don't go changing anything. But you know Jesus. You see, first of all, Jesus preached a turn the other cheek message. Turn the other cheek. He said, you you got to change your views about an evil person. And to make it more intense, He said, if anyone slaps you on the right cheek. Now, I don't know if you've ever thought about this or you've ever considered this verse, but most people in the world are right-handed. 
Most people are right-handed. As a matter of fact, let's just do a survey here. How many of you are, and when I say left-handed, you do everything left-handed. You do everything left-handed. That's your dominant hand. Some people bat right-handed and throw, uh, you know, or do some, you know, they do it different, ambidextrous. How many of you are pure lefties in here? How many we got? There's one, 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 two, two, three, four, five. Five people in here are left-handed. So most people are right-handed. And there might have been some I, I, I missed, but um, most people are right-handed. So if, if I'm right-handed and you and I are in a fight and I hit you, which cheek am I going to hit you on? I'm going to hit you on the left cheek, most likely. I mean, unless you're running away from me. And if you fight me, you're not going to be running away from me. I'm going to be running away from you. You might hit me on this cheek back here, you know. But I want to hit you in the left cheek. So Jesus didn't say left cheek. He said right cheek. What does that mean? Get the image here. If somebody hits you on the right cheek and they're right-handed, what have they just done? They backhanded you. You know, in Jewish uh, law, there there was a different punishment if you backhanded someone. Because it was... It was not only an aggressive act, it was an insult to backhand someone. I mean, it's demeaning, it's humiliating, it's insulting. So Jesus took it up a notch. He said, you know, even even though they strike you by backhanding you, added insult, even then I want you to turn the other cheek and say, might as well get this one too. You see, sometimes following Jesus means to take the insult without the need for retaliation. Jesus also preached a give your coat away message. He said, uh, if someone takes your tunic or your shirt, your undergarment, what's under, give them your coat as well. Your cloak or your coat. Now, I don't know if you knew this, but in Exodus 22, God said that a coat was a basic human right. Did you know that? God said in Exodus 22, he said, you can sue a guy for his coat, but you got to give it back to him at nightfall. Because a coat is more than a coat. Coat also becomes a blanket. And how will someone cover themselves if they don't have their coat, which is a blanket? So, a a coat is a basic human right. If you sue me, you can have my shirt, but you can't take my coat. But Jesus said, yeah, yeah. If they take your shirt, go ahead and give them your coat. You see, when following Jesus, sometimes we have to give up our rights to follow him. Jesus preached the give away your coat message. He also preached a go the extra mile message. Jesus said if, uh, if a Roman soldier, and this is, this is what was going on in that day, if a Roman soldier forces you, and they could legally do that, Roman soldier was riding through town or, or walking. You know, most of these were foot soldiers. They weren't, they weren't the officers. They were foot soldiers, and they were walking through town with this heavy pack on their back. Soldiers carry heavy packs because they got to have all their stuff, all their gear, and fighting gear, and sleeping gear, and all that stuff. Uh, you know, everything. They're mobile. They're mobile. And so if they come through town and they see a, a guy walking past them, Jewish guy, by law, they could conscript that guy. They could say, hey, boom, carry that pack. Now they could only do it for one mile. Can you imagine being a Jewish guy on your way home from work? You've been working all day and you're hungry and you're tired and you're ready to get to the house, see the kids, see the wife, and, uh, and, and you happen to be walking past this Roman soldier and he forces you to carry his pack a mile. I mean, can you imagine how angry and bitter and, and resentful you'd be every step of the way, every step of the mile. And when you got to the, when you got to the mile marker and they had mile markers, uh, you know, on the outsides of towns. And when you got to that, you threw that pack down and grumbled something on your breath and hopefully got away without being struck and went, finally got home. And you had to explain to your wife why you're two hours late now or three. And so the Roman soldiers could legally do that. They could do that. 
Jesus said, if they, if they make you do that, when you get to that last step of the mile, turn around and say, hey, I can go another. I can go another if it helps you out. Can you imagine the, the expression or the feeling of the Roman soldier? who I've never experienced, well, who are you people? What is this? Jesus said, go, go the extra mile. Go the extra mile. You see, following Jesus sometimes means returning kindness for cruelty. And then we get to the passage we've been wanting to get to here, uh, verse 43, where Jesus preached a pray for everyone message. He said, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. They would all said, yeah, yeah. We've heard that and that's the way we operate. Love neighbor, hate enemy. And then Jesus started to meddle. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. Love my enemies? Pray for the people who hate me, who persecute me? Might as well pray for everyone. And that's right. Here's why. Jesus said, for if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers... What more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? Now, when I was in college, I had a professor, a New Testament professor, who explained this passage to me like this, and I'll share it with you. It's helped me understand it, and it, uh, it, it may help you. Imagine these, these, like the first century Jews would have done, imagine that these tax collectors, you know, tax collectors were hated. They were the Jewish people who were working for the Romans taking your good hard-earned money and hounding you for it. If these tax collectors and Gentiles imagine they're in a bar and they're beer drinking buddies where everybody knows their name and they're all together and they're halfway to happy town when they start making uh, pledges of Masonic brotherhood and fidelity to one another. It's like, yeah. Somebody comes in here, if he comes to fight you, he'll have to fight me. I got your back, you got mine. One for all and all for one. And that's a noble thing. It's a noble thing to have the back of your buddy, right? I mean, uh, I don't know about you, I didn't get in many fights, like I said. Uh, I tried to avoid that, it wasn't my, I was a lover, not a fighter. Uh, but you might have been a fighter, uh, and uh, and it, it's, it's nice to know you got people who's got your back. You know, it's good to have big friends when you get in trouble. Amen? I mean, if you're going to fight, have your big friend nearby. And, and, and that is admirable. It's, it's loyalty the way loyalty should work. You watch my back, and I'll watch yours, and we'll go through life together fighting for one another because we love each other. But Jesus said, you gotta do better if you're gonna follow me. You gotta do better. Now, I don't know if that helped you understand what's going on here. These beer drinking buddies who are there for one another, and the only thing they have in common is that they come to the same place and they drink together and they uh, get drunk together and they fight together. And that's admirable. She said, you gotta, get, you gotta do better than that. If I only love people that I like and who love me back, what kind of a person am I? If I only pray for people who haven't offended me or offended the church or whatever, what kind of a Christian am I? You understand what he's saying here? Who does this, though? Seriously, who turns the other cheek? Who gives away their rightful coat. Who goes the extra mile? Nobody I know. But wait, there was one. Jesus. Jesus did this. 
Jesus practiced what he preached. In Philippians 2, Paul said, let each of you look not only to your own interests, but to the interests of others. and Have this attitude that was in Jesus who gave up his place to come down here and to be a man and to walk the road we're walking. And when Jesus got to the end of his life, he was deserted by his disciples. He was falsely accused by the religious uh, leadership. He was unjustly arrested by the Romans. He was put on trial by Herod. The crowds heckled him. The soldiers mocked him and spit on him and beat him. Even those he was hanging with, one of them criticized him. And what did Jesus do during all of that? He didn't do anything. He didn't do anything. You remember when he was in the garden and the soldiers came forward and Peter grabbed the sword of the Roman soldier? Jesus said, Peter, put that away. He said, do you think that I cannot appeal to my father and he will at once send me more than 12 legions of angels? 12 legions. That's 72,000 angel warriors. 72,000 angel warriors who have their toe on the line, leaning forward, ready to strike, ready to annihilate uh, the first century world for offending and spitting on and mocking and heckling their Lord, Jesus, the Son, the Son who is the radiance of God's glory. Twelve legions, 72,000 angels at his disposal. But did Jesus call them? Did he deploy them? No, because he didn't need them. He didn't need them. This is Jesus, the one who spoke the world into existence. The one that with just a word healed the lame and, and the deaf and the blind and made the, made the uh, dead come back to life with just a word. Why, he could have just whispered a curse on those people and they would have just uh, been incinerated if he wanted to. But Isaiah said he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb led to the slaughter and like a sheep before its own shears is silent, he opened not his mouth. Jesus didn't yell back. He didn't slap back. He didn't cry out for justice. What did he do? He prayed. He said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And when Jesus prayed for them, guess what? He was praying for you and for me. Because we are that crowd. We are those soldiers. He was praying for everyone. He was teaching us. You know, that's what it means to be a follower of Christ. It's not, Lord, bless me and enlarge my ter territory and give me a pain-free life. It's, Lord, use me to reach them. And you think about this, you know, I've thought about doing a sermon on the ones that Jesus touched. You think about the people, you know, like the thief on the cross. Jesus, Jesus didn't directly uh, uh, target him for evangelism. He just had an exchange with him. You think about this centurion. When the Bible says when the centurion saw what had taken place, he praised God saying, certainly this man was innocent. There's one man who saw what happened and said, I'm, pra I'm praising God. He was innocent, but you and I aren't, and neither are the people we're praying for, and that's why we need to pray for everyone. Now, I'm going to challenge you during this series, at least, to keep a prayer journal. Keep a prayer journal, and I want you to, uh, this week, I want you to spend some time <clears throat> praying for people, and here's the order in which I want you to pray for these people. First of all, I want you to pray for the people you don't even know. You pass them on the street, you see them out there. You see them uh, when you go to work, maybe at work. You don't know who they are, but God knows their needs. God knows how to, how to uh, help them. And I want you to pray for them. Make that your first priority of prayer. Pray for the people you don't know, because in this way, you're praying for everyone. Secondly, I want you to pray for the people you do know, but whom you don't want to run into at Kroger. You know what I'm saying. You know these people, and you know what they need. And you may not get past that one. Hopefully your list of those people isn't five or six pages long. Just a, a few. And lastly, I want you to pray for the people you do know and you do love and who love you back. 
and that'll be easy for you. That'll be easy. But don't spend all your time there. Make sure you go through the first two. Pray for the people you don't know. Pray for the people you do know but you don't like. And pray for the people you do know and that you like. And record your prayers and see what God does in your life. Will you pray with me? Almighty God, thank you so much for giving us your son, our savior. Thank you, God, for showing us that uh, he went to great measure to show that he loves even us, everyone, his enemies, his friends, his friends who became enemies. I pray, God, that you would give us that same attitude toward others as we begin to zero in on one name, which we'll do. But Lord, help us to start by opening up our heart to anyone, to everyone, because we know that you so loved the world that you gave your only son that whoever believes in him should not perish. Lord, that's everyone, everyone who would believe in him. Lord, that's my prayer today. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and sing this.